Truthfully, the things that God has prepared for us, sometimes we have to wait for. You know, patience is a very big part of receiving the blessings and the promises of God. Sometimes you're going to go through trials and difficulties. This has been a particularly uh, stressful week uh, for me. I don't know about you, but when things don't go the way that you would like them to, it's real easy to try to take over and fix them. You know, you notice something about the Holy Ghost. Sometimes he brings you to a position where you can't fix them. I was just sharing the other day, you know, we're living in a, this is a strange time. As far as what's getting ready to happen, um, I've got a pretty good idea. I can tell you that uh, whenever we see people just abdicating their responsibilities and authorities to try to please people, it's a disaster. Oregon, all, Seattle, New York City, wherever you have leadership that has abjugated their responsibilities to the people, see, those who are called by God have an obligation to the people. You are the reason we're here. We ought to be in a position where we understand that it's important that God's people, the sheep of God's pasture, need very much to understand that the Lord is concerned for you and he will direct you to a place where you can be both encouraged, revelated, and protected. Once you find the place of God's choosing, don't let the devil run you off. We have to be of the mindset that I am not abandoned. You are not alone. You can't make decisions based on what you think anymore and see positive effect. You say, well, I'm in pain. Sometimes the Apostle Paul was in pain sometimes too. But once we've committed our way before the Lord, then we just have to stand firm. He said, because in due season and in due time you shall reap if you don't quit. What are we learning by having to go through these things? Well, very simply, you know, you've said the saying, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. But faith is perfected in weakness. The stronger you are, the more your strengths will be tested. And the more you have to be willing to yield over to God's way of thinking and God's way of doing things. In this generation, we are surrounded by people who think they know more than God. In fact, the last great move of Antichrist will be to worship him as God. And Antichrist is nothing but a, the soul man gone berserk. He is a man that is totally overwhelmed with soulish endeavors. The five senses, as far as Satan is concerned, are the ruling entities on this earth, except amongst those who love Jesus Christ. Because we are motivated by a sixth sense. By faith. By faith. I said by faith. Therefore, if you allow anything in the way of your touch, smell, taste, feel, all, all of these things, your imaginations, all of these things work in opposition to faith. And you can't serve two masters. Either you will serve faith or you will serve your own fears. Anyone who's decided or made the decision to serve their own fears is subject to those fears. You have not because you ask not. And when you do ask, you ask being, you're in James, you're asking according to your own emotion and your own feelings, those things will ultimately bring on destruction. You can't be led of the flesh and led of the spirit at the same time. They both pull in different directions. But what we can do is be really considerate as we observe what's being told us as the truth and then referring to the word of God which is the truth. Then I saw in the news the other night they're actually pulling down statues of Jesus. Yes, in Seattle. Pulling down and burning their Bibles. Statues of Jesus coming under desecration. See, these people that are doing this stuff, they, these are not people who have your interests at heart. These are people who have no walk with God at all. The God of this world, perhaps. But you see, all of this, get ready, we're going to turn to the book of Revelation chapter 3. All of this has to do with what Jesus prophesied would happen in the last days. And it shouldn't come as any surprise to us that there are those who say they are, Jesus said, but I don't know them. But what's happening now is there is a breakdown in that intimacy that exists between our, our Heavenly Father and our, our Lord and Mentor, Jesus Christ, and the church. 
And the church is always referred to as she, for the most part, although it probably shouldn't be because the church is neither male nor female. However, the church is, in metaphoric terms, wedded to Jesus Christ. When you're born again, you have made a commitment to Jesus Christ, which is intimate. See? When the marriage vows are, are conjugally, uh, you know, completed, that's because the husband and wife now get to know each other on a whole different level. Nothing's hidden, nothing's secret anymore. Shouldn't be. And that joining together of the male and the female, the way God created it to be, forms a union, a bonding. There are obvious things that you understand, but when that bonding takes place, there is a connection between you and your husband or you and your wife that's unique. It's supposed to be unique and set apart to the point where it is not only unique but separates you from every other experience that you could have had. And you've often heard people say, you know, a wife will say, I I, I was worried about you. I felt like, you know, you were in trouble. There's a connection that goes beyond just natural connection. It's a spiritual connection. But the point I'm trying to make here today is that the gap between the world system and the true church, now when I say the true church, Jesus spoke all the time about the church divided unequally. Now we're going to go over to Revelation chapter 3 and we'll start with that today because we're talking about the widening gap. Why are you surprised, the apostle writes, when you see people running amok? Why are you surprised when your faith gets tested? Your faith has to be tested like fine silver or gold. It's heated in a furnace until all the impurities rise to the surface so that the master can skim them off. But you've got to realize heat, tribulation, trial, stress, all of these things can be used to your advantage if you know how to cast your care upon the Lord. Or you can take them on yourself and start beating yourself up. That ain't going to help. You won't win. When you start fighting yourself, nobody wins. Huh? So redirect that against the devil. Once you've found the place of God's choosing, hold fast. Don't quit. Hang in there. For in due season, as I said, you will reap and you don't faint. Now, Revelation 3, and I want to read uh, a couple of verses, please. Uh, Revelation 3 and verse 20 through, 20, 20 through 21. New King James Version, and I don't know if you happen to have a message Bible there as well, but I'm going to read them to you both, okay? Now it says, now look at me, I stand at the door and I knock. Now this is a picture of Jesus Christ, obviously, not speaking. Revelation, the first three chapters of the book of Revelation are talking about the church age in which we are still in, all right? Once we get into chapter 4, if you look at, Chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Then after this I looked, and behold, and the voice of God said to him, Let me reveal unto you the things which must shortly come to pass. Future. The first three chapters of the book of Revelation are talking about right now. Now, this scripture, when I was at Bible school, they said, Oh yeah, it's talking about, you know, people repenting, or rather, people being born again. It's not. Jesus here, by his own admission, through the angel as well, is talking about the relationship that Jesus has with his church. Now, church age. And it says here that he stands at the door and he knocks. Now, there are numerous pictures that were painted about this particular scripture. And in all of them, which makes sense to me, Jesus is knocking on this door with his right hand and in his left hand he has something else. He has a lamp. Now, the time frame of this is already toward the end of the church age. It's at the end of chapter 3 which is predicating prior to his return. Are you listening? If Jesus was standing right here, and I'm reading his word, if he was standing right here and he said to me, behold, I stand up, he's talking to you. He's not talking about unsaved people. He's talking about those who have presumed salvation. Anybody can say they're saved. And the only way you can find it if they really are is see how they live and what they say they believe in and add the two up and see what happens. 
When people say, I love you, and then they turn around and leave you or abandon you, they don't love you. They love themselves more than you. The gap is widening between the world and the church. Now, the way God does things is he deals with the church first. The word church is ecclesia, or those who are called out from the world. There are many more people who would identify with the church than are the church. And we'll see that today. But what I'm trying to tell you is if there's going to be a, a, a resultant correction in a world gone mad, God's first priority is you. Right? His first priority is you. And in this particular scripture, Revelation 3, he is coming at what we might call twilight. He's coming at a point in, geolo in, a gra in a chronological time where his coming is imminent. So it makes sense to me when you see some of the old masters when they painted this, Jesus got a lamp in his left hand and he's banging on the door with his right. Standing outside the door Right? But there's no doorknob there. If that door's going to open, you're going to have to open it. From the inside. And the lamp predicates to me that the timing of his, his cautionary banging on the door of your heart is prior to his return, his final second return. It's getting late. And Jesus is standing outside the door and he's banging on it. In the Greek, that's not a tap. It's a bang. Whose heart is he banging on? Yours and mine. Doesn't necessarily mean he's banging on the door of someone who has no walk with God. He's banging on every believer's heart right now. And whether you open that door to him or not will determine your future. Now, why wouldn't you open the door? I don't want you to come in here. I'm embarrassed. Do you remember in the Garden of Eden what happened? After Eve and Adam did their trippy thing, they sat on fig leaves and hid behind a tree. Remember that? And God said, hey, Adam, where are you? Oh, you know, he knows where he was. And they made a little squeaky noise. And he said, I hid from you because I was afraid. In other words, he didn't open the door. And God said, here's the reason you didn't open the door. Have you done what I told you not to do? <laughs> or have you not done what I asked you to do? If you go through your life, my brother and sister, vehemently checking whether or not you hear that still small voice, He's talking to all of you right now. He's talking to you at home right now. As soon as this broadcast clickers off, you find a quiet place and say, when Robin was talking to me, Lord, I've got a bit of a twinge in my heart. Can you, can you tell me, can you show me, Lord, what it is that you want of me that I'm not doing? I, I don't want to be found, you know, locked away in my heart from you. You're my... Pastor, you're my saviour. I, I can't make it without communion with you. And he'll talk to you. See, now he goes on further and it says, he said, if you hear me call, now why wouldn't they hear him? He's banging on the door. Some people don't want to hear what he has to say. So consequently, they alienate themselves from their relationship with the Lord. And they pick up an antichrist or anarchist spirit. Matthew 24, in the conclusion, or excuse me, in the confusion, what confusion? What's existing right now in the world system? It's confusion. Even in the, the church is confused. But why is the church confused when Jesus knows exactly what's going on and the Bible already you're in a place where you've been taught this for years. What's going to happen? The departure of the faith, the apostasy, the falling away. Yeah? In all 
of confusion, lying preachers will come forward and deceive a lot of people. You talk about right now. Now, what's the antidote? Jesus knocking on the door of your heart. If you let me in, I will come in and I will sup. That's an old English word which means the evening meal. The final meal. This is where the family <laughs> sits down and enjoy the fruits of their labors as it's provided by your Savior. It typifies by the Last Supper. Communion and also the marriage supper of the Lamb. He's knocking on the door with a lamp in his hand saying, will you let me in? I need to talk with you and I will sup with you if you let me in. In other words, the final meal of the day, the communion, the last day's relationship between you and me will be established. And when I come into your life, the way I'm asking to come in now, you and I will have fellowship eternally. There's no mention of him leaving again. If you open the door, I will come in and I will have the final meal of communion with you. And we'll never be separated again. This is the Lord telling you and me that at the last third chapter of Revelation, this is the last chance we get as individuals to say yes to the Lord and no to the devil. The last chance to associate myself with others of like and precious faith. Lying preachers will come and deceive a lot of people. For many others, the overwhelming spread of evil will do them in. What's happening right now? Nothing left of their love but a mound of ashes. What love? Agape. Nothing left of their faith and trust in Jesus Christ than a pile of ashes. What did Jesus say between the separation of the true church and the church? The, 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 the tares and the wheat, sheep and the goats. Didn't Jesus say, you correct me now if I'm wrong, gather all those who deny me in their words and in their actions and gather them together in preparation for being what? Burnt. Do you mean to tell me, Robin, do you mean to tell me that the, this separation, if I don't do something about the reparation and the restoration of my fellowship with the body of Christ and with Jesus himself as a personal act of dedication, if I don't choose that, then I will be apportioned, as Jesus said, with those who have no faith. Do you, do you think that's right? Try, try getting a conversation together with someone who's just walked away from the house of God and walked away from their faith. And what do you see? Dead. Deadness. No zeal. No fire. Just confusion because they don't know who to believe anymore. Why don't they believe it anymore? Because the Bible says, Jesus makes the statement that they believe lying preachers. Now the preacher doesn't necessarily mean an anointed man or woman of God. Anyone who decrees a doctrine is a preacher. The doctrine of self-righteousness has to be preached. In the last days, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. There is a difference between salvation and being called into the ministry. You believe that? There's a reason why Jesus said, if any man would follow after me. If. Not talk about salvation. He says, if any man would come after me, let him, what? Deny himself, pick up his cross, and follow me. That's not salvation. That's discipleship. Wide is the pathway and wide is the road that leads to destruction. But narrow is the pathway and narrow is the road which leads to eternal life. And very few are they that find it. Nothing left of their love, agape, nothing left of their love of God but a mound of ashes. Staying with it, 
verse 13. That's what God requires. Stay with it to the end. You won't be sorry. And you'll be saved. All during this time, the good news, the message of the kingdom will be preached all over the world as a witness staked out in every country. And then the end shall come. So buckle up, ladies and gentlemen. This is the last days. The last of the last days. And if Jesus is going to get through to you, it's going to be a very personal wake-up call. Let's go back to Matthew th uh, uh, Revelation 3.20. He says, look at me and stand in the If you hear me, open the door and I'll come right in and sit down to supper with you. See the supper, evening meal. Conquerors will sit alongside me at the head table. <laughs> Just as I have conquered and taken the place of honor at the side of my father, that's my gift to the conquerors. Amen. Fellowship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and all those who have been overcomers in the last days, fellowship with God. Now look at this. In that scripture, notice he says, and I, open the door unto me, Jesus speaking, and I, Jesus speaking, will come in and sup with you, one on one. Is that right? But the ultimate reward is not just you and Jesus. The ultimate reward is for you to have fellowship with the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, and every other child of God who has paid the price to overcome. The book of Revelation, all through chapter, to him that overcometh I will grant to sit with me, but not just me and my Father, and the departed saints of God all together and the marriage supper of the Lamb is a recognition of that. This sifting, this widening of the gap, I'm sorry, you're going to have to accept it. You're going to have to see some people that you love walking away from, the, from their faith. John 14, please, verse 23. I want to show you this because it's in two different areas here. To, to show you that the, the widening of the gap is because people refuse to accept the Trinity. They consider their own opinions more of more value in these last days than having fellowship, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Those seem like myths or dreams to them. Oh, you must be some kind of a weak person. No, Jesus said, because a loveless world, said Jesus, is a sightless world. A loveless world is a sightless world. Violence, Departure from the faith, lawlessness. It says men yielding over to their own lusts, walking away from the relationship that they should have with their brothers and sisters in Christ, giving heed to seducing spirits. Jesus says here in John, if anyone loves me, he will carefully keep my word. Carefully. And my father will love him. We'll move right into the neighborhood. <clears throat> Not loving me means not keeping my word. The message you are hearing isn't mine. It's the message of the Father who sent me. Another version says, If a man love me and keep my word, my Father will love him, and we will come in unto him. There's the supping. And we will make our abode with him. So, see, what I'm saying is, as the world system begins to divide what was the church into apostasy at the same time this is happening Jesus Christ is knocking on the doors of millions of hearts around the world saying if you'll let me in I'll correct the things that you're lacking and then you and I and the Father and the Holy Ghost will all sit down together and be the family of God you know realize that when Jesus returns Satan's bound for a thousand years during, what happens during that thousand years? This earth is rewound and rewired. Where are we going to be? Ruling and reigning on this earth. In our spirit bodies. And at the end of that thousand years, what's happened? What happens? In order to give all of those whose lives have been given over to the Lord during that thousand years, it says Satan is loosed for a season. He's back again. 
What's he going to be doing? Destroying the saints. But his season then is very limited. It says then and Jesus Christ will destroy him with the words of his mouth. Satan is bound up, cast into the pit. Him along with the false prophet and all of those who served the Antichrist and his kingdom will be doomed to hell. This recognizing of the latter day more than any other place in the Bible, and I'm almost out of time, but anywhere else in the Bible, in 2 Thessalonians 2, and I read it to you last week, the Apostle Paul gets into specifics which are not found anywhere else in the Bible in the New Testament. And I'm going to read this out of the Message Bible, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 1. He says, My friends, these next words, read them carefully. Slow down. Don't go jump into conclusions regarding the day when our master Jesus Christ will come back and we will assemble ourselves to welcome him. That's the catching up. Verse 3, don't fall for any line like that before the day comes. A couple of things have to happen. We shared this last week. The apostasy, which is the falling away, the disconnection of relationship. So it says first the great falling away. That has to happen first. Everyone say first. This apostasy, this breaking loose, this breaking off of relationships, turning your back, turning their back on the things that we've always considered to be basic and fundamental in the Christian faith. And Jesus said, depart from me, I never knew you. Marriage supper. How did you get in here without a wedding garment? And the second thing is the debut of the Antichrist. He'll defy and take over every so-called God or altar, having cleared away the opposition. That's the church. Having cleared away the opposition, this Antichrist spirit, then he'll set himself up in God's temple. You see that in the book of Daniel. Don't you remember me going over this in all detail with you? Are your memories that short? Do you remember that I told you Antichrist is being held back until just the right time? That doesn't mean the spirit of anarchy is not now at work. It's secretly working and it's underground. The time will come when Antichrist will no longer be held back, will be let loose. But don't worry, the master Jesus will be right on his heels and blow him away. Poof! The Antichrist is out of here. <laughs> the Antichrist coming is all Satan's work, all lying signs, miracles are fake. Evil sleight of hand that plays to the gallery of those people who hate the truth. It's the same truth that could save them that they may be condemned with all of those who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Yes. Meanwhile, we've got our hands full continually thanking God for you, our good friends, so loved by God you are. God picked you out as his from the very beginning. Think of it. Included in God's original plan of salvation by the bond of faith and the living truth. This is the life of the Spirit that he invited you to go through. And this is the message that we preach in which you get in on the glory of our master Jesus Christ. You can be a part of it. So friends, take a firm stand, feet on the ground, head lifted high. Keep a tight grip on what you were taught, whether in personal conversation or by our writings. May Jesus himself and God the Father who reached out in love and surprised you with the gifts of unending help and confidence put a fresh heart in you, invigorate your work and enliven your speech. Two verses in the following chapter say this. Following, finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may run swiftly and be glorified just as it is with you. Yes. Pray that we'll be rescued from these scoundrels who are trying to do us in. I'm finding, Paul writes, that not all believers who say they are are really believers. <laughs> but the master never lets us down. He'll stick by you and he will protect you from evil because of the master. We have great confidence in you. Paul says, we know you're doing everything we told you to and we will continue doing it. May the Master take you by the hand and lead you along the path of God's love and Christ's endurance. Our orders, backed up by the Master Jesus, are to refuse to have anything to do with those among you who are lazy and refuse to work the way we have taught you. Don't permit them to freeload on the rest. Yes. 